Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another short edition of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. I'm one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, Michelle St. Patrick Hewitt, and we're back. We're back for a little conversation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this one an intriguing one. I'm going to call this one a fascinating one. And it's about Jason Holder. Over the last few weeks, some say a month, Santolkin, myself, and sometimes me on my ones have kind of in the in light of the Australia test series and following the Australia test series we've dropped comments into various episodes where we've said Jason Holder walks straight back into the West Indies test side and every time we've made that comment I've noted hasn't gone unnoticed that several people in the comments whether on Facebook whether on Twitter whether below uh, the video itself on YouTube have kind of retorted to us and said, no way does Jason Holder get back into the West Indies test side. And even with, even with a, I'm not even giving it the kind of level of vitriol that we've actually received in that people seem legitimately angry um, at the notion that Jason Holder should, should walk back into the test side. And I've, I've, I've found it fascinating. I, I found it very, very intriguing as to why people think this is open for debate. Now, and, and I say this, people who've been longtime listeners, followers of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast will know that me in particular, when Jason lost the captaincy back in 2020, 2021, I was one of the I was one of the loudest advocates to say it was time. And I thought it was long overdue when Jason lost lost the captaincy. I thought he'd had it for way too long. Um and that Actually, the record under his captaincy demanded that somebody else just get a goal. Now, what I find interesting is at that time when I was writing about it in like things in in publications like The Cricketer, um, when I was doing videos on it, I remember at that time back in early 2021, late 2020, when I was saying it, uh, middle of 2020, in fact, that people would get at us and say, how dare you say that Jason has led the West Indies so well um, he he's like a statesman. He speaks so well. Duh, 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 duh. He's the right person to see the West Indies. So what I find interesting is four years later, myself and Santolki are some of the few people in the Caribbean willing to defend Jason and say, of course, he walks back into our test side. I find it really fascinating that some for some they've almost gone full circle. The result in Australia and in particular at the Gabba, notwithstanding. And of course, it was historic and Shamar Joseph and this, that and the other. A ruthless test team, a ruthless international side, doesn't just retain a team because they pulled off a historic victory. Shamar Joseph bowled out of his skin with a bruck foot. And largely speaking, along with um, Josh De Silva and Kevin Hodge in seventies um, in in the first innings, largely speaking, that draw against Australia, so that uh, test series, that test win against Australia that led to the test series draw was off the back of some key individual performances led by Shamar Joseph. A ruthless test team and a ruthless test setup looks at that victory and says, actually, there's still room for improvement. And they don't just say, because they pulled off a, a, a historic victory, our first one in 29, 27 years, whatever it was in Australia, that everybody just retains their place. I don't, I don't buy that notion. I don't buy it. I think that everybody retains their place in so much as they deserve to be to go to England on tour but it doesn't mean that everyone retains their place in terms of deserving to start the next test. The next test will be England when, when the West Indies turn up in June, uh, sorry, when the West Indies turn up in July, right? At Lords, 
just because the West Indies won their last test against Australia does not mean that that first 11 plays automatically in the first test against England in July. You pick the best team for the conditions and the situation. So when I looked at the, the West Indies test performance versus Australia, and we've done it again, go back into the archives, look at all of the content we did around the Australia test series and the kind of videos and live videos and recorded videos that we did after that test series. Myself and Santoki identified that Justin Gray's spot at number six was not only under threat, but he was the most likely player in that first 11 to be immediately dropped to make way for Jason Holder. I'm not saying that Holder will bat at six. It could well be Josh De Silva. Ke Kevin Sinclair may well retain his place and bat at seven. Holder may well come in and bat eight. Though those, those three, you would think, are in a probably in pole position, I would say, for six, seven and eight in whatever order. But when we made that point that Graves is going to leave or should be should be step aside in the team for Jason Holder to, to, to return, like I say, people got in the comments and cooked us, cooked us and said, what do you mean? There's no spot for Jason Holder. His time in the test side is done. Absolute dog shit nonsense. Nonsense. I, if you're one of those people who messaged us saying vociferously saying that Jason Holder should never return back to the test side again. I need you to come with stats and facts that support that that uh, the assertion. I need to come with stats and facts that support the notion that Jason has nothing to give in test cricket. I am not conflating Jason's performances in test cricket with ODI cricket or T20 cricket. Those are different arguments. We're talking about red ball cricket. Come with stats and come with facts that justify why Jason Holder shouldn't go to England. Why Jason Holder shouldn't walk back into the first 11 in a West Indies test side. I want straight facts. I want straight stats. Not emotional talk. Not emotion. We don't deal with emotion on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. We deal with statistical evidence and analysis. I did mine. So here's mine. These are Jason Holder's last three test series, okay? Against India with the bat, he averaged 27. Obviously, this is a series, two-match test series that we lost um, that we lost 2 uh, one nil during the second test. So against India with the bat, which was his last test series, that two-match test series, Jason averaged 27 with the bat, right? If that matters to you. With the ball, he was very disappointing. He only took two wickets at 62 apiece. So when you hear that, I can totally understand why people would say Jason Holder is finished. He only took two wickets at 62 apiece against India. That's not good enough for somebody who's expected to bowl quite significantly so for the West Indies. Hear that. But then look at his two series before that, immediately preceding the India series. South Africa away where we lost 2-0. Jason averaged... 39 with the bat, with a high score, I believe. Let me just double check. I think he got a high score of 81 in that test series. Yes, he did. 81 not out, in fact. So against South Africa away, where we lost 2-0, Jason averaged 39 with the bat and 23 with the ball. Seven wickets at 23 with the ball. Prior to that series against Zimbabwe, he averaged seven with the bat, but before anyone cooks him for that, he only faced 14 balls, and that was a series, obviously, which we won 1-0. Some will still say Mash is supposed to do better. Okay, I hear that. But he took 10 wickets at 20 apiece versus Zimbabwe. So in his last three, sorry, was it 10? Sorry, five wickets. Sorry, why did I say that? Five wickets at 10 apiece versus Zimbabwe in that two-match test series, which we won 1-0. So in Jason Holder's last six test matches, he has taken... 14 wickets, right? In his last, so I'll say that again, in his last six test matches, all in 2023 in essence, he has taken 14 wickets. With the bat, I'd need to actually work out the average with the bat, but let me just uh, accumulate this. With the bat, because I looked at averages across the series, he has scored a total of, let me just quickly do this for you, should have added this one up beforehand, to be honest. This is my fault. Uh, quick mass. 1, 3, 2, plus 53. 
five, eight. He scored 185 runs in nine innings at bat. Okay. Obviously, some of those are not out. So before people say to me, but, 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 that's not good enough. Da, 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 of that, two of those were not outs. So when people try to calculate their averages, they need to bear in mind that there are some not outs in there. Okay. And also, you need to consider, well, where does Jason bat in a West Indies test order? So just to repeat that again, against India, he averaged 27 with the bat, 62 with the ball. Against South Africa, 39 with the bat, 23 with the ball. Against Zimbabwe, 7 with the bat, 20 with the ball. Those are Jason's last three test series. So are we saying the injured performance notwithstanding with the ball, are we saying that based on his most recent test series, his last three test series beginning at the start of 2023, that, uh, sorry, Australia was at the beginning of 2023. Are we, um, oh, sorry, Australia was at the end of 2022. Are we saying that Jason Holder has not done enough in his last three test series to walk back into the West Indies test side? And if you're saying he hasn't done enough, who in domestic cricket would perform better than that? If you're going to tell me that those performances against India, South Africa and Zimbabwe were not good enough to justify him walking back into our test side, who in the domestic scene who has his skill set in terms of uh, a medium fast right, uh, right arm pacer who can bat a bit, who has a better, who is likely to return better numbers than that at the highest level? I'll wait. Don't worry, I'm still waiting. Give me a name, please. Give me a name of someone you would call who you would expect to do better than that. I'm still waiting. So then I said to myself, okay, Mash, okay, people are still going to come with some kind of argument in the comments, so you're going to have to dig deeper than that. So then I said to myself, but how did Jason perform against England? Because that's where we're going in the summer. I said, how did Jason perform against England the last time we were in England? The last time we were in England was that bubble pandemic tour when we saved cricket, right? And we saved English cricket. In that tour, three-match test series, Jason averaged 23 with the bat, largely batting at number seven or so. And he took 10 wickets at 30 apiece. So the last time we were in, in England, Jason averaged 23 with the bat, batting at seven or eight. I need to go back and, in fact, let me go and tell you. Let me not even speculate. Let me go and tell you exactly where he was batting in that series, what position. England versus West Indies, Jason batted at, Number these were so he these were his six innings and the positions he batted in the six innings eight eight nine eight seven eight. So the last time he went to England in 2020, Jason averaged 23 batting at number eight and he took 10 wickets at 30. Let me pause again. Who in the domestic scene would you trust to have a better, more recent record? than Jason Holder at the international level? And also, who would you trust in the domestic scene to go to England and perform better than Jason has done in his most recent tours of England in English conditions? If you don't want Jason Holder in the West Indies test team, give me a name that you think that would outperform those numbers. As I said at the top of the show, it's about picking, it's about being ruthless. It's about picking the best team to win matches. It's about horses for courses. We're not in the we're not in the game of sentiment. Just because those eleven men won a test match in the Gabba doesn't mean you reward those eleven men to just play straight away in the next test. Have you got better players out there? And if you have got better players out there, who would infinitely improve the side more so than who than the side that beat the Australians in the Gabba? Jason Holder does. Jason Holder does. The statistical evidence shows you that Jason Holder will. I'm not saying that Jason Holder is a is a straight swap for Justin Graves and that Jason Holder suddenly bats six um, in England. 
that doesn't necessarily mean that Jason bats six. It may mean that Josh has to bat six. It may mean that Kevin Sinclair keeps his space and, and Josh goes six and Sinclair goes seven and Holder goes eight. I'm not really fussed about where Holder comes in the team. I'm saying that Holder comes back into the team. Now, here's where I will now try and defend those who say Holder doesn't come back into the team. The people who will say Holder doesn't come back into the team it all depends on what you consider your bowling attack to look like in England. I've already said in previous videos, go again, go watch the West Indies, go, go watch the Caribbean Creek podcast archives where I've spoken about this before. I think we are probably going to enter a stage where Kevin Sinclair is seen as the Roston chase type spinner, somebody who balances out the side, which means you don't pick good Akesh Moti as a frontline spinner. Now, remember, you don't necessarily need to go in with a frontline spinner in every... We're, we're playing England in at Lords, Edgbaston, Trent Bridge, right? Do we have to pick a frontline spinner in every one of those test matches? Not necessarily. P position 9, 10, and 11 could likely be three fast bowlers. At this moment in time, you would expect that to be Shamar Joseph, Alzari Joseph, Kimar Roach, which means your number eight position is likely to either be Jason Holder as another seamer, Kevin Sinclair as a batting, bowling, all-rounder who can bowl spin and hold up an end. Yeah, it's probably one of them two, with Josh De Silva moving up to six and one of Sinclair or Holder being number eight. That is what I'm saying a West Indies bowling attack probably looks like when we get to England. Obviously, there's the Gudakesh multi conundrum as well. That's another conversation for another day. But what people need to ask themselves is this. Would you rather have a, 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 a batting bowling attack which looks like this? Justin Gray, six. De Silva, seven. Sinclair, eight. Kimar, sorry, Alzari, Kimar, Shamar. Or would you rather have Josh De Silva, six. Sinclair, seven. Holder 8, Alzari, Kimar, Shamar. Are you lot saying that because we won in the Gabba that Justin Graves just keeps his place because you have to reward the victory? Or are you lot on, uh, coming on my side here or on my side here where I say, no time for sentiment. Jason Holder is better than Justin Graves. Jason Holder comes back into the West Indies test side. If you disagree with me and you're saying Jason Holder does not come back into the West Indies test side, who plays instead? Who plays instead, whether it be Justin Graves or whether it be someone else, who plays instead and what is your statistical analysis and justification for why Jason Holder shouldn't play instead of that person? Not emotion. Remember what I said. Don't want an emotional argument here. I want evidence. What is it that you are basing this evidence on as to or sorry, this decision on as to why Jason Holder shouldn't just walk straight back into the West Indies test side. Now, final point for me. What some will say is this. They will say, Mash, Jason didn't go to Australia. He said he wanted to go play T20 cricket, prepare himself for the World Cup. So therefore, he chose T20 cricket over, over playing for the West Indies. Therefore, he doesn't get to say when he comes back into the West Indies test side because he made the decision not to play. And I hear that. He wasn't the only one. Carl Mayers did it. Um, Brandon King did it. Obviously, the usual T20 man did it. And I hear that argument. But West Indies are not in a position as a international setup to turn our noses up at players just because they went and played T20 cricket. When I get it. I get the argument but we're not in a position to just say, and we shouldn't be in a position where we just say, well, because you did that, we can, we're we not picking you. We can, of course, we can do that. I'm not saying we can't do that. We can do that. But based on our talent pool, I do not think that's the right thing to do. If Jason Holder was given a blessing to go and play T20 cricket instead of playing uh, test cricket in Australia, and that was all agreed with Desmond Haynes and Andre Coley and Craig Brathwaite, and he was given the blessing to do that, then that means that nothing should be held against him now if he wants to come and play in England. And then we have to, that's when we go back to my argument of forget sentiment, 
the get emotion, does him coming back improve the team? And if the answer is yes, then whoever needs to get dropped gets dropped. If you genuinely believe that Jason Holder coming back into the West Indies test side doesn't improve the team, give me statistical analysis and evidence which justifies it. I've been Marcel St. Patrick Hewitt, one half the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Bit of a tricky one, this, because some people will be shocked. Some people will be like, rah, Mash coming to the defence and and the massive defence of Jason Holder. I wouldn't expect that from him. It's because nothing's ever personal for me. If I think something is right and will better West Indies cricket, I will say it. I don't care who the player is. I'll say it. I've been Marcel St. Patrick Hewitt, one half the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. You can find the Caribbean Cricket Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, X, at Carib Cricket. We're now on TikTok, by the way. Just search Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Um, obviously, the website, www.caribbeancricketpodcast.com. We're on that road to 8K on YouTube uh, for YouTube subscribers. So if you're watching this and this is the first time you're watching the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, like the video, share the video, subscribe to what we do. Leave a comment below. If you're new, I always like or at least try and comment to everybody who leaves something below. Um, yeah, and just follow us on all the socials, people. If you'd like to support the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, head to www.patreon.com forward slash Caribbean Cricket. Every little bit helps, every little bit counts. And if you want our latest merch, the crew neck uh, sweatshirts, if you want those, get at me in the DMs. Let me know. I'm sure I can, I've just shipped one to America. Um, so if you want to get one of those, let me know and I'll tell you the prices and so on and so forth. I've been Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt, one half the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Should Jason Holder return to the West Indies test side? Thank you and good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules coming. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket. By the fans, for the fans.